Catherine, I think you had some uh, questions from the audience that we're going to come through. Uh, maybe we can put those up. And then if anyone just has live questions, um, we're, we can be a bit informal and uh, love to, you know, um, kind of open it up to, uh, to the audience. <clears throat> so maybe the first one, uh, how much data would the panel say on average is needed to make a human or socially acceptable prediction analysis in a market trend, um, years, gigabyte, et cetera? <laughs> Anyone want to take that? Go ahead. Um, yeah, the more data, the better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, really, more. Uh, but, but it goes back to kind of the last question. If you're focused on what my ROI is, where am I going to get the biggest bang for the buck? Then I'll know how to go back into my models and, and validate those results. Um, and how do you validate those? You know, using different algorithms, you can test the accuracy of a training set versus an actual data set. And through that kind of manipulation of data, you, you can then determine when you've had enough. Um, I don't have a specific number, but the more the better. And I would like to say that I, I don't know if it's necessarily measured in terabytes or gigabytes, but length of history we find is very important to a lot of folks. So in other words, uh, you know, the main data sets that I offer go back to about 2005, so that you can see really full cycles. And I think that that's important when you're making decisions. Whether you want to see just one segment, which might be several gigabytes, or all the data that's six terabytes is up to you. All I'd add to that is, given that it says, I think you're specifically highlighting prediction slash analysis. For a prediction, everything that people said is true, that's correct. For an analysis, it can be very short, yeah. right? If you have sure. something that otherwise was uh, publicly reported on an aggregated level, but you have transaction data and now you can see you know, how Hertz and, uh, or Uber and Lyft are taking market share in Brooklyn. Well, all you need is like a few months if that's gonna drive your human analysis, right? So it depends whether you're trying to get differentiated analysis slash insight for which a cross-sectional answer is fine, then you don't need a lot of history. If you want a prediction, then yeah, you have the history side and you have a general rule of Edkins razor uh, as to how you think about the relationship between the prediction length and the amount of data that you need to get comfortable with it. At the end of the day, just look at your epsilons. Yeah, my, I, Michael's spot on. It's, it's kind of like, I think the value of the data, the historical data is important, but next month's data is the most valuable data you're ever going to have. If I can add just one, um, one more point here. So one of the things that you realize, you know, we talk about um, earnings data, it comes in quarterly, right? So uh, you have to realize as you do KPI forecasting, you don't have a lot of history to go by as far as data points. You have history as far as time in the past, but if you go at 20 years, you know, it's four points per year, it's 80 data points that you have to train a machine on. For deep learning technology, you need to have a lot of data to train on. Not only that, you have to correlate that data with other more frequently available updates of other data sets. For example, if you're trying to get factors that are technical in nature or fundamental in nature, alongside with the Equifax data that comes to us every month, by the way, uh, you have to find ways to extrapolate the data uh, into the future between data points so you have those kind of updates in the same granularity so the data is uniformly distributed among the constituents. That's how the machine makes a decision of what factors are more meaningful than others. It takes a little bit of a skill and know-how to do that, but it's important to understand how to combine multiple independent data sets to coexist in one database as one of the same source in the eyes of the machine. Great points. I think we have uh, one really important question. It was about uh, snow levels uh, for the Rocky. <laughs> yeah. and I was that. Look at that. I was actually laughing at that. Like, <laughs> in, in all yes, the season, it's supposed to be extra snowy in the Rockies this year, uh, but anything west of that, it's going to be warmer than normal, and it's going to be a little extra cold in the Northeast. <laughs> and that's uh, part of our seasonal coming up, and I'm very excited about that. And then in all, <laughs> all seriousness, so there is. Um, the question of alpha decay around data, and I think uh, you had some interesting examples of, of some things that you'd seen 
and use cases ar around whether that you had prepared some slides. Did you want to reference those, or do you feel like you've kind of addressed those already? Um, <clears throat> I've addressed the use cases. We we can look at the slides uh, just because they show one that I haven't discussed yet, which has to do with uh, the concept of a probabilistic forecast. Most times. Uh, we know exactly what the forecast is. It's deterministic. So I know on this hour, on this day, it's going to be this temperature. But what's the likelihood that it's going to be above that temperature? Because it's not always that amount. We actually have, if you go to the next slide here, uh, a lot of our traders in the upper right, they, they can set these thresholds that, you know, will let them know the likelihood of the temperature that it will be that day by hour. Because there's an actual whole ensemble of probabilities underneath called the probability distribution function. And if you can actually take all of those individual inputs and feed them into your models, you, you, you know, you're really coming up, you're, you're really breaking down our forecast into its most accurate components. And you're able to make smarter decisions based off of that. So, so this slide here, a lot of our traders, they use this type of information because they're trading on energy. Temperature is very important. One or two degrees difference is significant amount of uh, difference in the amount of power that they're going to produce and revenue that they're going to include in their load forecast. We have a lot of utility companies that are involved with that. So they're all very interested in our probabilistic. Uh, if you go back a couple slides, you'll see um, that we, we put a lot into our forecast talking about data models. We have one of the largest data science teams ever. People go out and try to build their own weather models, but we've, you know, if you take a look, we ingest 110,000 personal weather stations from the Weather Underground. That's someone we, uh, that, that we purchased. All of the METARs that are out there, that's our airports. That's what most people make their decisions on. And, and most people are not near the airport, so they're getting the wrong information. Uh, we give 182 forecasts in our model, the ECWMF. There's a, there's a NOAA model. But people just use NOAA. They're one of our 182 inputs. NOAA is a great forecast. I mean, they're a great place to go for info, but they're just one of them. If you look at everything on that slide, it's 400 terabytes of data a day that we ingest that update every 15 minutes. So I just wanted to point out that, you know, when you're working with others in terms of weather, not all weather is the same. You know, people are like, oh, yeah, what's the weather today? Matter of fact, if you're using the Weather Channel app, we're actually bringing, you're collecting, and you've accepted. We're, we're using your barometric pressure right now as ground truth all around the world. We have over a few million people that use the Weather Channel app, and that gener actually generates millions of dollars of revenue for us because of the marketing. But if you choose to do so, that, you know, that's another example of alternative data that we use ourselves. And all of the personal weather stations out there, they're not all accurate. Matter of fact, I talked to our data science team. They only use a handful of them because we've done statistical you know, machine learning testing on those to see which ones have been the most accurate over time. So when we ingest data, we not only just use it, but you have to have the smarts to know if it's the right data. And I don't have the answer for that. It's, it's the techniques and the tools are out there for people to kind of make those connections. Can I? Uh, um, and, th and that just goes to, yeah, makes it I just want to add to that. I mean, that explains why every time I look in the morning, uh, the local news, I never, never get it right. You know, it's always raining when it's not supposed to rain and the other way around. <laughs> so thanks for clarifying sure. that. But uh, in all seriousness, you know, one of the things that you have to understand, you know, so great data, obviously, very powerful, very thoughtful, very um, well articulated, um, Brian. But from consumption perspective, machine learning, think about it, you know. So you have, uh, for example, uh, the notion of how weather can affect uh, consumer behavior. You know, going shopping in the mall when it's extreme weather. Now, extreme weather can mean one thing in Florida, and it can mean something totally different in uh, Alaska, right? So if you have a very cold day in Florida, that will be uh, 60 degrees or maybe uh, 55 degrees, uh, which obviously is not the case in New York or anywhere else uh, in the north, uh, northern hemisphere. So. The point is that you have to uh, normalize the data in a way to the average local temperature to see how much you deviate from what people expect because that, behave, that affects their behavior as a consumer. That's what we call feature engineering. That requires two things, domain expertise from the data provider mm -hmm. and the data science expertise from the data consumer or the data uh, manipulator that basically takes it to the machine learning model and the outcome for the investment professional. So I wanted to make sure we are clear on these type of uh, uh,
portions of responsibility along the uh, supply chain. Yeah. And I just add briefly to that, to the original point around one of the challenges of using alternative data was integrating it and testing it. That approach really helps ease the user adoption cycle into mm -hmm. looking at these things, right? Mm -hmm. These all sound like huge, massive data sets, which I'm sure very expensive. Being able to make a decision as to, do I think that there's some value within here? I'm seeing some alpha out of that. And then eventually, based upon that, maybe I want to dive into the deep and uh, do all of the work. Uh, the, the phrase at JP Morgan that got me through was crawl, walk, run. And uh, in most ecosystems, everybody is forcing you to either run or I'll speak to you in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, I just want to be sensitive on time. Uh, did you want to do a few more questions, or do we need to, uh, yeah, we a couple more questions? Time. Okay, um, <clears throat> we have uh, a number to choose from. Uh, it, it's been suggested that some data sets for sale contain MNPI. Uh, I think that's an important one. That's something that's very functional and tends to be top of mind for anyone who wants to begin executing. Uh, does anyone want to tackle that one first? Sounds like an Equifax. <laughs> What's yeah. no, no, actually, what is material? Uh, material sorry. Oh, material, not public you can, information. You can also extend it to uh, personally identifiable information. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, personally identifiable, uh, personally identifiable information, no. Uh, materially, one thing that I, you know, and we could talk about this afterwards is within the data sets, I, uh, especially on the consumer side, we also have commercial data sets and some spending data sets coming out. But on the consumer side, uh, one of the important things is we protect both the consumer, so you out there who might be in the set, and also the person that supplies the data. So in other words, I'll tell you an auto loan, but I'm not going to tell you that the loan was originated by Ford. Um, get the idea? So it's one of those things where I think that our data sets are more inputs, should be thought of as inputs into larger models that include many and diverse pieces of data to come up with your own conclusions. Uh, from our perspective, from a personally identifiable as well as a business sense, um, there's nothing material non-public about it. In fact, many of you might know about um, the New York Fed publishes quarterly uh, reports, and this is where you read in the Wall Street Journal, consumer credit's at an all-time high, et cetera. It's called the Household Debt and Credit Panel, and they've been publishing on it for 10 years now. That's the cousin, that's Equifax data. And just what I would add towards that is that um, it's, the SEC hasn't formally published any guidance around this or legislation there. There are some efforts to try to get to standards, which again, the FISD is uh, helping lead on there. Go check out their due diligence documentary, or documentation. Uh, the key is that there is the expectation that you try to figure it out, uh, that you have letters of attestation, that there's questions within your due diligence questionnaire, that you've explicitly made them stand up and say that they are not providing this type of information. Subject to having done a best efforts approach to figuring that out, the general opinion of Lowenstein, Sandler, and the others is that you'll be covered, uh, albeit there is some risk given that we haven't actually had a precedent around it. And there's like some red flags. So if you're a data buyer and your data provider is saying, you know, I'll give it to you, I'll give this um, release, say it's some kind of governmental release or something like that, I'll give it to you guys a little bit earlier than anybody else. That would be a red flag. Check with your attorneys <laughs> in compliance. You know, um, if it's too predictive, like it's so correlated to revenue, that's that's another red flag. You definitely want to check with your, you know, you, the, the folks who really know the legal and compliance guys who are going to really, you know, keep you out of hot water. Maybe we can tackle um, one quickly on bias. It's just a, it's a very practical aspect of dealing with data, and maybe we could talk about uh, the the impact of panel bias. And and I know we're running short on time, so keep it tight. But if you if you could touch on uh, how you deal with that in your data. Brian, you want to start us off? Um, yeah, right. I mean, it's always hard to remove bias, um, but when building, you know, when building models, you can build them without bias, unsupervised, and um, you know, it. I, I don't. I, I don't know what else really to add to that, other than just you know, try try using as many different types of data sources as you can get your hands on, and um, try not to be biased. <laughs> <laughs> Erez, you want to try to top that? 
Well, um, so here's the thing. Um, even uh, the best intentions in the world can adversely uh, and indiscriminately add bias into the research. Um, and okay. even unintentionally add bias to the research. Think about when we first started to do our back testing, it was in the beginning of our company's evolution. By the way, uh, my co-founder, Tucker Balch, is right there. Raise your hand just to want to say hi. Tucker is uh, carrying the Lucena legacy now with JP Morgan as a uh, director of, uh, managing director of AI research. But uh, when we first uh, started the company, Tucker and I, and uh, we uh, conducted back testing, um, everybody was doing back tests on long only research. Uh, and we got great results because the market was just going higher and higher for the last 10 years. And, uh, you know, uh, that was kind of the natural thing to do. And nobody even thought about trying to go with a short only uh, signals, uh, which, by the way, are much more difficult to, come, to come, uh, come by. And we actually have some good examples of uh, some amazing short only strategies that I can uh, share with you uh, offline here. But nevertheless, uh, the idea is to create uh, um, to minimize bias, as you said. Uh, um, as best as you can. One of the things you do in the research is to create what we call cross-validation and robustness testing. So you have to create basically a, a, a back test or a simulation that you can change things that are not critical to the model itself. For example, you trade every Tuesday rather than every Wednesday and see if the results are adversely or, or dramatically different. And if they are different, you're overfitting. You basically created some sort of a uh, uh, model that's only very uh, very well suited for a situation that's not necessarily rep reproducible in the future. So there's ways to create those disciplines in research that you learn over time to uh, minimize these type of uh, biases and uh, and uh, overfitting of, of a model. You know, and actually, can I, can I add to that? Because I just thought of a couple examples where, you know, to remove bias, when people build reports, dashboards, that's biased. Because they say, I picked these fields because this is what I know and this is telling the story that I think I know, and this is why revenue is on its way down. That's biased. I've worked with customers where we took all the data upside down, we fed it through like a classification model, Chate 5, that prioritizes all of the different measures and tells you which ones are the leading contributors to that profit. So using data science, a, a certain type of model, you can actually rank and prioritize which fields are, are most are th that contribute the most to that particular metric, like profit. And from there, you could build your dashboards because you've done some sort of correlation analysis that says that these fields, out of the 100 fields you have, actually impact profit the most. So using predictive analytics removes bias. And, and just, just very shortly, there's really just two core biases. One, or there's a lot, but there's two that I would deal with uh, up front. The first one is around survivorship bias. Most of the people who are mapping it to tickers haven't taken into account acquisitions, bankruptcies, et cetera. Uh, Erez's DQE thing does a pretty good job around that uh, and hire him to go take a look at it. Um, the, We're not selling today. Uh, the second thing uh, that I think is interesting around the panel bias and how do you deal with that. So the first one, if it's survivorship bias, just throw it away. Uh, stop there. If it's around panel bias, essentially what you're talking about is model selection. The problem with panels is the growing size of the panels and therefore the more information. So you look at if you can get the volume contributions, if you could just see like the kind of log change in the volume contributions of people, you'll be able to see whether there's a real skew associated with that. If there's too much, it's pretty hard to overcome. The second thing within there though is being able to think about it just as a model version. Every time they expand their panel, that's the same thing as like changing your NLP approach, et cetera. So as long as you can have that as a component of your metadata, then you can actually abstract away for that. If you don't have it, then you're gonna have an issue. And Tracy, that's why I'm pushing for that information in the FISD standards. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just, just, just quick on data uh, bias is, if anyone wants to follow up with me and have has any questions about E, because what, what, what I'm really talking about, my main data set is 10% of the US credit population. How do you get the 10%? Happy to take that offline. Uh, the other thing I'd have to say is that bias is not all, bias isn't always a bad thing. Most people, like in my example of uh, retail cards, right? That selection was biased towards people with retail cards. Depends on what you're trying to solve. Understand your data. 
trying to prove a point. Yeah. Excellent place to pause. Uh, why don't we continue the conversation? I know we have a number of questions we didn't have a chance to get to, but maybe we can uh, continue the conversation in the back. And uh, we'll call it a wrap for tonight. Eras, thank you so much for hosting. And thank you.